Fantastic. Well, let me just introduce who's here. Um, so I'm Irene Malati. I'm one of the movement disorder neurologists here at the UF um, Parkinson Foundation Center of Excellence. We have Dr. Nick McFarland, who is also a neurologist and Parkinson expert, also specializes in atypical Parkinsonism. We have Dr. Heather Simpson, who is an occupational therapist and is representing the rehab team. So that would be occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy. We have Ms. Carol Chang, who we're so happy to have with us um, that spoke today about home modifications and, and improving our environment. We still have um, Dr. Josh Cooper with us, who will be here for at least a portion of our Ask the Expert panel. So we'll make sure his questions get to him right in the beginning. Um, Chuck Jacobson isn't planning to answer questions, but we could not do this without him. He's just a fantastic member of our team who helps us with a lot of our IT needs, even though that's not his main role. He helps run the database where we collect information about Parkinson's and learn a lot about what affects people with Parkinson's, how we can do a better job. And he always volunteers his time and helps us run this annual symposium. And one more time, I'd like to thank the Parkinson Foundation who supports these educational programs and the Stockdale Lecture Fund, um, who helps us bring in speakers when we need to. So I believe that the questions from the first session aren't appearing here, but luckily I was afraid that would happen and I pasted them all into a Word document as we went, so we would not miss the chance to answer important questions. As we go, go ahead and feel free to type anything in the Q&A. Um, and we'll do our best to answer them. So since I have them, I'm gonna read the question and then I'll either invite someone to help answer it or um, anyone's welcome to volunteer on the panel. So um, this first question says, a lot of the symptoms that were mentioned as typical for Parkinson's disease are typical for aging too. So maybe they're parts of normal aging. Is there a definite test now for Parkinson's disease? Um, so I guess we'll just go down the line and I'll take this one and then we'll just kind of all jump in. So this is really a, a great and important point is, well, you talked about being a little stiff or being a little slow, and I'm pretty sure that everyone who's in my age group might experience this. So how do you separate that for Parkinson's? Is there a test? So still in today's world, we diagnose Parkinson's based on what you tell us and what we see when we examine you. So we call that a clinical diagnosis, meaning it's not a blood test. It's not a, you know, stick your finger on the paper on this spot and it's gonna tell us if you have it. We do have some tests that can help us support our diagnosis. One of those is called a DAT scan. And it's an imaging study that uses a radioactive tracer. It takes a picture of the brain and it looks different if you have Parkinson's or a related condition in the family of neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, or it will be normal if you just have a tremor, like an essential tremor, or if you don't have Parkinson's. So that's an imaging test. And a lot of research is going into trying to find a test that could diagnose it earlier or more definitively. So right now there's research looking in the eyes on something called optical coherence tomography. It's been shown that the fibers in the retina, the layer back there looks different if you have Parkinson's or if you don't, and that's emerging as a test that might be used. There are biopsies of the submandibular glands, that's a drooling gland under here, and biopsies of that gland show changes related to alpha-synuclein, the protein that abnormally deposits in Parkinson's. And even skin biopsies are being used to show signs of the pathological changes, meaning the disease process changes that are related to Parkinson's. So all of this research is going on across the globe, trying to find a quicker way and a more definite way to diagnose it. Um, but a lot of the symptoms you see, you're correct. They overlap with normal aging. Normal aging brings along changes in memory and mobility and slowness and stiffness. And so it really shows when those things are out of proportion to what we expect for normal aging, and we see other symptoms that are specific to Parkinson's that we kind of suspect that. Does anyone else want to add to that? Or do you think that pretty much covers it? That was great, Irene. Okay, so I'm sorry, I have a cuckoo clock and it's, driving me cuckoo, but if you hear music, that's what you're, you're hearing. It'll stop in a second. 
So the next question is, someone mentioned foot inversion. What is this? And is it typical for Parkinson patients, foot inversion? So maybe Dr. Patel could explain what is foot inversion and maybe Josh might have, if you have any thoughts on um, suggestions for foot inversion. So Dr. Patel, can you explain what that is? Yes, so foot inversion can mean when your foot tightens up and turns in one specific direction. This does not happen to everyone. Um, sometimes young onset Parkinson's disease can experience this more often. And you can experience this with medication on and sometimes in the off state as well. Um, we use medica optimizing your medication regimen to help fix this. Sometimes we can even use botulinum toxin injections and physical therapy can also help. So I'll let Josh answer the rest. Thanks. So yeah, in that particular area, um, we, when you feel like your foot's kind of turning in, it feels like a cramping sensation or, you know, you notice it in, either in your gait cycle with your walking or just when you're just at rest. Um, like Dr. Patel said, medication um, is used to help out with that Botox, but usually we recommend a, at least trying, you know, conservatively with uh, some form of stretching program, um, utilizing either a soft tissue massage or uh, some form of uh, muscle release to help the muscle relax. Um, stretching out the plantar fascia, that's like the muscles on the bottom of your feet, as well as stretching out your calf can sometimes help with uh, relieving that uh, tightening or that foot inversion. Um, also working on strengthening of the opposing muscle groups. So you have the foot inverters, and then you also have the foot everters, which kind of turn your foot out. Um, helping out with, you know, strengthening those areas can sometimes help minimize that, that foot turning in as well. Dr. Heather, did you have anything you wanted to add to that, or do you think that covers it? I think I think Josh had that one. <laughs> okay, perfect. So the turning in of the foot, sometimes it can be a sign that your medicine's wearing off from your Parkinson's. And so sometimes we make medication adjustments that can help be helpful. Sometimes it needs injections or physical therapy approaches. So the next question I'll ask um, if Dr. McFarland wants to take on, um, and it says, Someone did not mention loss of smell as a typical symptom of Parkinson's. Is the loss of smell a significant symptom of Parkinson's disease? Yeah, that's a great question. I appreciate that one. Um, so loss of smell is something that we do see in aging and it tends to be found also in Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. So it's not necessarily specific to Parkinson's disease, but more of aging and degenerative diseases and as a whole. So um, it may be one of those early, we call prodromal signs, one of those signs that we see before people even show up in the clinic and before we even diagnose you with Parkinson's disease. It's similar to things like um, constipation or other signs like that that occur before the onset of sort of some of the other motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So we're carefully looking at smell or loss of smell, um, but just be understand that it's not specific, okay? Uh, there are many things that can cause loss of smell. Um, for those of you, I mean, thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic here, one of the most common symptoms is really early on is losing that sense of smell. It's a good example that's a virus and not Parkinson's disease that can also cause loss of smell. Um, of course, we are looking at this closely as one of those prodromal symptoms and screening patients, or at least beginning to start screening patients. In fact, um, we are going to be participating in what's called the Parkinson's, um, uh, Progressive Parkinson's Marker Initiative, which is the PPMI program here at the University of Florida. And loss of smell, or we call anosmia or dysosmia, is actually one of those symptoms we are looking for in patients as a screening uh, tool to look for patients who might have early signs of Parkinson's. So um, not specific, but definitely a potential indicator. Yeah, and it's interesting that that tends to appear even years before people have a lot of obvious motor symptoms of Parkinson's. So we consider it kind of a clue. Aside from the coronavirus pandemic where sense of smell is a symptom that people recognize, um, aside from that, 
there aren't that many things. Allergies can cause loss of smell, brain injuries can, but when we see symptoms of Parkinson's with someone with loss of smell, we think it's a pretty good um, clue that, that we may be dealing with Parkinson's. On a similar path, Dr. Patel, somebody asked, what is RBD? It was listed as a prodromal symptom, I think in Dr. Almeida's talk. And somebody would like to know, what is RBD? So RBD stands for rapid eye movement uh, enactment, dream enactment, behavior disorder, where at time, when you go to sleep, you go through various different stages of sleep. Um, you may have heard that you go through light sleep and deep sleep. Then there's a stage of, called rapid eye movement sleep. During that time, normally your brain tells your arms and legs to completely relax and not move. However, in Parkinson's disease, the opposite happens. So you lose that inhibition and you actually act out your dreams. So you move your arms and legs. You could kick or accidentally hit your bed partner. You can even roll out of bed. And so although it's not a dangerous thing and it is something we see in Parkinson's disease, it can be dangerous if you fall onto the ground and hit your head on a nightstand, you know? So I recommend that the bed space where you sleep in is safe around your bed. So making sure there's no sharp objects around your bed, that sort of thing. We do not recommend any rails or uh, do not constrain your bed itself, but just making sure that there, are, there isn't anything that you could hit your head on if you were to fall. Okay. I'm sure Dr. Chang has a lot of, uh, or Ms. Chang has a lot of solutions for that if you needed it, <laughs> or your other occupational therapist. Hey, maybe I can add, a, I'll just add some additional information on this. So, I mean, so this uh, REM sleep behavior disorder is really one of the early signs, you know, that we think may be a prodromal sign for both Parkinson's disorders. And interestingly, actually, it may be even a more sensitive sign of future dementia than it is for Parkinson's disease. So it is something that we are very carefully looking at and uh, is a indicator that we pay a lot of attention to. Um, it is sort of treatable. Um, so they do talk to us about it if it's occurring um, and uh, let us know. And Ms. Chang, uh, from an occupational therapy standpoint and a home modification, do you have anything that you wanted to add about that? You know, I almost always use like those little half bed rails and it's not for constraint or anything. It's really just to have a little place for them to just feel safe. Like the, I can feel it on my arm. I'm okay. You know, it stops you from rolling between the nightstand. I have had many patients like that. Um, but it's also really good because then when you come up and you're sitting on the edge of the bed, you're taking your 10 seconds for your blood pressure to normalize before you take your step. It gives you something to hold on to. So I, I really like those solutions. I think they're easy. They're about 25 bucks. They're, I mean, everywhere you can find them. That's great. And yeah, I know they ordered, they sell those on Amazon, I know. So you oh, can yes. them pretty easily <laughs> and they're very they removable. And... Yeah. What's that, Heather? They, they can travel with you, right? Oh, so that's a great yeah. thing. I never thought about yeah. that. And they have like little pockets in there because, you know, you're always looking for your cell phone or whatever, your remote control. And so, you know, you, you don't want to be rolling around the bed, like searching around for all these things. These are fall, per, fall risks, right? So organization. <laughs> That's great. So, and like Nick said, there are medicines that can, when people are falling out of bed or, or it's making it hard for their bed partner to stay in the same bed, there are medicines that help this problem. So when necessary, we can, we can treat it that way too. So uh, I'm gonna read the next question. I'll take a stab at it, then we'll kind of go down the line, whoever wants to jump in. The next question is, when should a Parkinson's patient start drug treatment? In the mild stage or in the intermediate or the more diffuse stages? When should I start medicine? And this is such an important, question that I'm happy somebody asked about it. So we talked to you about what are the medicines, but not like, when do you need those? And so there's not a one size fits all here. I would say the most important time is when the symptoms are interfering with you maintaining a healthy and active lifestyle that's going to keep you in the best long-term position with your Parkinson's. So when the symptoms are interfering with your quality of life, 
and where they're interfering with your wellness and especially your abil ability to stay physically active and engaged in your community and social life, that would be a great time to take medicine. There's a lot of fear out there and a lot of myth that if you start medicine too soon, you're gonna make your disease worse or it's gonna stop working or it's gonna run out. Um, and the fact is there's a lot of research on this topic. We've done some of it and many, many, many other people have. It used to be feared that, well, if I start levodopa earlier, it's going to make me get worse sooner. And the fact is that's not true. In fact, they've shown studies where they looked at people who couldn't get levodopa even if they wanted it. So in particular, a population in Ghana. And they compared it to a population in Italy where they could get medicine when they wanted it. And so the people in Ghana started levodopa later. And they looked at people with the same duration of disease and they figured out that dyskinesia, those wiggling movements, they were predicted by how long you had Parkinson's, not how long you took medicine for Parkinson's. So the longer you have Parkinson's, changes in the brain occur that make people prone to experience dyskinesia when they get the medicine replacement. And the longer that you have Parkinson's, you need more medication because the changes of the disease require more medicine to compensate for the missing dopamine that gets more significant the longer that you have it. And so it's not the case that holding off as long as you can is good for you. In fact, that's been studied and it shows it's not better for you. You, you don't change the course of disease for sure just by taking medicine sooner or later, but by staying active and being physically um, engaged in exercise and other things, that's probably your best interest. So definitely discuss this with your doctor and your healthcare team. Um, but it's not always true you need medicine right in the beginning, but it's definitely not true you should wait as long as you possibly can. Treatment symptoms are more responsive to treatment earlier in Parkinson's, and the longer you have it, symptoms become more stubborn, sometimes even refractory on some symptoms. And so really, it's just looking at your quality of life, what's affecting you, and working with your healthcare team. Pavna, Nick, did you have any thoughts other than what I've said about that? I can add, I, mean, I, I, I entirely agree with Dr. Malati was really pointing out. I think the one key thing really here is this is a decision that is different for every single patient. And it's something that you should partner with your physician with and discuss with your physician when to start medication. But I think one key thing really to understand is sort of, you may think about it this way, um, the medications are helpful and sort of if you wait too long to start medications, disease actually progresses. And sometimes when we stay, start medications like levodopa later on, it can actually be more difficult to find the right dose. Um, and it turns out really starting earlier, sometimes actually you can start with lower doses and gradually work up. And one way to think about it is how soon do you want to start feeling better and how much longer do you want to wait to actually improve your quality of life? So it's actually been shown actually in studies that patients who wait longer tend to struggle a bit more, they're holding off. And those who actually start a little bit early actually have a longer period of really good quality of life for their Parkinson's disease. Um, so it's a difficult question, but one that we can help you make the right decision with. And I'll add that there's even been some research in deep brain stimulation surgeries. A similar question is, when should I have surgery if I'm going to, which most people don't end up going that route, but some people do. Should I have surgery early or wait as long as possible? And there's a definite time point where the, the symptoms are enough to be worth having a surgery, but you don't want to wait until having symptoms that don't respond to surgery. So it's been shown that people who have therapies like deep brain stimulation over time maintain benefit over the natural progression of Parkinson's. So treating symptoms is a good thing, um, is the moral of what I'm saying. I'd like to ask our rehab team if anyone wants to comment on what about therapies? Like, should I wait until I'm falling and freezing? Um, is it like not worth it? Don't get mad at me because I just want you to answer. Is it not worth it to do physical therapy if I'm like kind of fine and I go to the gym twice a week already or even three times? Or is there a role of rehab before I have really bad symptoms? Heather, you want to go for it? 
Well, sure. I, I think, I think I know from our fix all team, we like to say, um, as soon as it starts to interfere with your function, um, that's when we, we definitely refer, um, we say that it's important to consider medication. So we, we always are the non-medication based group, right? We say exercise, um, modifications, um, going back to the basics on, um, from that perspective, but um, we always we always see people right after they come from the doctors who say, "Let's up your meds." And they're like, "I don't want to," or "I don't want to take meds." And we're saying, "Well, you know, is it stopping you from doing things that you like? Is it stopping you from doing the things that are important to you? Is it stopping you from exercising? Are you too um, apathetic to get up and move? Are you too um, is that tremor stopping you from doing X, Y, and Z? Are you?" fearful of falling um, and those type of things. And then that's that's when I think it becomes really problematic. So no matter what stage you're in, if it's interfering in your function and keeping you from being the person who you wanna be and who you used to be, then I think that's really where we think um, it's, it's more important than just exercise. Yeah, and kind of, adding to that. Um, so a lot of times any, if you, like Heather said, if you do start to notice something is impacting your, your function day to day, you know, you don't want to wait until you have an injury or, you know, you start having a fall or something starts to, to happen. Um, we often try to capture patients, you know, we monitor them every so often, uh, according to our, you know, plan of care, just to make sure they're not falling off or they're, they're not having a decline. And, and that way we can capture you know, any issues that they might have before it gets to the point where like they really, really need us. Um, it's all it's all about, you know, establishing a good reference point. So that way we know what a patient is capable of um, prior to when they start to have that decline. Um, if we see a patient, you know, after they started to have some decline, we have no reference point as to what they were doing before other than what they tell us, of course. But um, it'll be nice to, you know, get those initial measures and say, hey, like we know that your balance is okay right now, so let's try to keep it there for the next you know year or so. Whereas if we see them later on, it's like, well, we didn't we didn't know what your balance was like before, so we don't have that initial reference point. I want to throw it out there that these kinds of things like exercise and th and you know having good lifestyle habits these are really hard to you know establish. Um, as soon as you have Parkinson's. I mean, these are things that ideally, if you want to start when you're in your 20s, that you don't have to think about it by the time that you get up to, you know, your 50s and 60s or whatever. I mean, you know, 85% of people know that exercise is better. So why do only 10% do it? It's hard. <laughs> so training these lifestyle habits beforehand, it's vital, like build those things in there. I, I'm a huge proponent of building those things in early so you can just put that aside and you can fix the other stuff, right? That's great. So thank you. Now the next, I have a few questions coming in related to genes and precision medicine. So I'm gonna take those in two parts. I'll, I'll answer the first part, then I'll pass it on to Dr. McFarland who will be perfect to answer the second part. So somebody asked about hearing that the way to go is personal or precision medicine and is UF working on this? Why are, are, are we or why aren't we collecting DNA samples about people with Parkinson's? And so I'll answer one part and then Dr. McFarland will talk about what's being done at UF um, for this. So if you were at last year's symposium, a doctor named Dr. Espe talked about well, we're doing all these studies on people with Parkinson's as if they're like all the same and we give the drug to like 500 people and say it didn't work or it did work. But what if those 500 people, what if 50 of them have one gene mutation and 50 have another gene mutation and 50 have like two gene mutations and we're, maybe that drug would work really well in the people of one kind of cause of Parkinson's and maybe not in the other. So should we be looking at people based on their specific Parkinson's? And this is totally a movement going on in the field. The Parkinson Foundation is running a study They've already completed one study where they took genetic um, testing in about 300 people, if I recall, with Parkinson's for seven of the most common genes. The problem is there are a bunch of genes that cause Parkinson's, not just one gene. But they took seven of them and they tested them and just under 20% of the people had one of those seven they tested. Um, and so the goal is if we figure out 
what is the difference? We might be able to make drugs specific for different people. And so there are multiple studies going on doing that. There's one gene in Parkinson's, in Parkinson's that affects glucocerebrosidase. So it's one particular enzyme. There's a drug being studied just to work on that enzyme in people who have that mutation and they don't because it shows that people who have that mutation or don't have an increased amount of a certain uh, protein that targeting might help. There's another mutation called LARC2, and there are at least three different approaches being studied just for that gene. One is to, um, we, they can either try to replace the product of the gene or counteract the problem with an overactive gene. And so there are different medicines being developed that are specific to certain genes. And the question is, well, then why aren't we taking DNA on all of our patients? And Nick, do you wanna jump in there with what's being done on um, genetics and biomarkers at our center? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. I, I do wanna just point out to, to all the patients or caregivers out there, you know, we are just sort of in the beginning of this. So a lot of the medicines are still in research phase. So it's gonna take some time for us to get there. We're talking a little bit big about this, but it is, an, it is a shift in the way we look at Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's patients. Um, I ask you to be patient. Um, at the Fixel Institute for Neuro Neurological Diseases, we're actually beginning programs and we brought in one really international um, neuroscientist, uh, Dr. Matt Fair, who is an internationally known sort of neurogeneticist. He's worked for many years on Parkinson's genetics as well as other neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and his lab is growing very quickly and we are building a neurogenetics program at the University of Florida. So we will be taking um, patient samples. Um, it's not built overnight, but we are building it gradually. And we hope to be able to actually get genetics on almost all patients that come through our door who seem to fit a particular um, specific, we call phenotype or presentation. Um, so we're gonna start at one point. So for patients who fit a specific sort of uh, presentation for Parkinson's disease, we also have other programs where we're looking at some of those more common sort of simple genes, sort of like the glucose side days, we call it GBA or the LRK2, that, which is abbreviated as LRRK2, which is one of the most common causes of both sporadic and familial Parkinson's. Of course, there is a predominance in specific ethnic groups. Um, so not as common in Caucasians, more common perhaps in we call Ashkenazi Jewish patients, North Africans, for instance. So, um, so there is a predominance in certain groups. So um, all of this actually is basically going to lead toward a more precise or precision really based on you really of how we try to treat you. It may be that you have had, if you have this specific gene or collection of genes, we might select this sort of specific set of drugs to treat you. We might treat you earlier with a specific drug, maybe not levodopa, maybe something else that might target the genes um, that are particularly abnormal in you. So um, to you know, answer the question short, really, we are beginning a program. We're hoping to do this collection. Um, it's actually pretty easy to get genetics. We don't really always, blood is really easy, but we don't always need it. We can do a simple sort of cheek swab to collect cells. Um, so it's really easy to do. Um, we're going to be rapidly doing that. So look forward to that. Okay, great. Um, so I have a couple comments and questions about risk factors that are not genetic. So epidemiology, and as it's being looked at for environmental exposures, like US military bases and industries with contaminated waters and solvents and radioactive fallout. And what about all that in Parkinson's? So um, I can, and are we doing anything to, to fight that? Or there was a question about pesticides and is anything being done there? So I'll answer what I can. Um, a, a really large, large um, stroke answer is that we definitely know that there are toxins that probably at least are bad for people who are have a genetic makeup that makes them susceptible. So there may be things that some of us do just fine with and some of us don't. We don't know enough about how much of a problem those things are or which ones are the real troublemakers. There is a movement, Dr. Okin, our colleague at the University of Florida and the medical director of the national level Parkinson Foundation, he has um, co-authored a book about ending Parkinson's disease and they talk a lot about pesticides. And in fact, they have 
a movement going called the Red Letter Movement. And if you Google Red Letter and Parkinson's, you'll find an opportunity to send a letter to the government supporting the banning of three particular chemicals that have evidence of increasing the risk of Parkinson's that have been banned in other countries, but are still used in our country. And so they're actually lobbying to remove some of those potential toxins um, from, from use. And so for free, you can log on and ask to be sent a form letter that you would just sign and send in. And so the hope is that they can get hundreds of letters to flood them and say, get rid of this bad stuff. And then maybe they can get rid of that bad stuff. Um, so that's a movement that's kind of stemmed from one of our docs. Nick, did you have anything or anyone have anything to add to that? I, I can only add, I, I just want to point out to patients, you know, these studies, you know, are, they're difficult to do, you know, these epidemi epidemiological studies require, you know, trying to understand sort of what people were exposed to during a period of life that might have been years ago. And the questions often asked are sort of, how long and how much were you exposed to? And often these are extremely difficult questions to actually answer. So they end up being really large and long-term studies. So they're sometimes often quite expensive, but they are what we call epidemiological studies and they're highly important. And there are many uh, groups around the United States and internationally have actually been doing this. So we, we know several pesticides and herbicides that have been associated with Parkinson's disease, things like rotenone or Paraquat are two examples. Um, and of course, some of them are actually still used. And there are a whole bunch of them actually that are out there that we're aware of. And we even use some of these in the laboratory to model Parkinson's in preclinical or called animal models to study disease. Um, so there's a lot of active re research going on. It's a difficult area of research, of course, um, but it's an active area. Um, so keep, you know, stay tuned. And of course, we. Um, if you ever get asked to be part of it, <laughs> join it. Yeah, and Heather posted in the comment in the chat the link to that red letter campaign. So I'll take this question. How do you know if a body movement, for example, in your face is dystonia, which most commonly happens when people are under medicated, or dyskinesia, which most commonly happens when people are over medicated? So movement in the face can be tricky because when your muscles activate, it can be hard to say, is that dystonia or dyskinesia? Some of the most helpful data points or pieces of information are the timing of that related to the timing of your medicine. So taking some notes about when that movement bothers you and when you last took your medicine can be very helpful because sometimes the timing within the pattern of your daily doses is the most useful information. The other thing that's very useful is to take a little cell phone video if that's something you're able to do or have someone help you. Because if we can see the type of movement, it's very helpful. Common dystonia will be tightening and pulling. Common dyskinesia is a little bit more of an active movement, but sometimes it's really tricky to separate. Um, Nick, did you wanna to add to that? Or do you think that covers that? That's great. Okay. There was a question about myofascial release. An individual said myofascial release um, had, has helped me. I actually had to Google the letters, what that stood for, but they were asking about myofascial release, MFR, um, and whether that should be used in Parkinson's. It's not been studied to our knowledge in Parkinson's, but, but Heather's willing to share some comments about it. Sure, thank you. I was just gonna write back um, on that comment, but there are no um, no studies specifically on myofascial release in Parkinson's. And I believe Tom, in your comment, you said anecdotally you found that it was helpful temporarily, and that is typically anecdotally what we see in the clinic too. And Carol, you might be able to um, uh, duplicate this as well. But anecdotally, myofascial release, what it does, it's it's a form of massage. Um, oftentimes where they break up the fascia that sits on top of your muscles um, that makes you feel really good. It's quite uncomfortable while you're getting it done, but it breaks apart the, the tension of the muscles, but it is temporary. It does oftentimes makes exercise a little bit easier because you have increased range of motion, maybe a little bit less pain, but it is temporary. But what we can tell you as a rehab team is flexibility training and exercise on your own does just as well. So if you can get on a daily stretching program, 
can do some of your own myofascial release through slow, prolonged stretching. Um, you don't need someone to necessarily do it for you. It's a little bit easier when someone does it for you, but stretching on your own has been highly evidence-based, highly effective, and that is evidence-based. Um, so no myofascial release has not been studied, um, but exercise, slow, prolonged um, stretching has been. Um, and so um, in that effect, it can be very helpful. I don't know, Carol, if you want to add anything. Yeah. So actually I did want to add that, you know, the, the power, um, the Parkinson's wellness recovery is so perfect for that because it's active dynamic stretching. So this prolonged stretching is very difficult to really like go long-term. It's, a, it's painful. It, it's not fun. Right. But you know, when you combine like Parkinson's wellness recovery exercises, you're getting the flexibility, but you're also getting the strength, right? And I, and I feel like that that is the difference between, you know, saying, okay, is it massage? Is it like this? Is it that? Let's combine them all. Let's do it all together because we only have a certain amount of willpower to exercise and do what we need to do. Let's just put it all together and like get it done, right? So in its functional based, right? Power is also very function based. So you're trying to lift up the, the foot so that you can step over that, you know, obstacle or whatever. But at the same time, I'm stretching out my hamstrings and I'm getting my hip flexors stronger, right? So I, I definitely think that everything that increases flexibility is going to help right? And anything that increases strength. But if you want to try to get it all done together, <laughs> do the rock steady, do like power or something, anything. And Dr. Patel put, posted the, because power offers free videos online. So she posted the link in um, the chat over there for you. That is really great. And um, I believe that's Amanda doing that behind the scenes. Amanda, could you post uh, Julie Segura's email there too? Somebody asked about, is there any way to see what trials UF is doing? And Julie Segura knows all of those trials and can speak with you and maybe get you plugged in. Also, when we send out the information after this, we can get her email address. So if you wanna know about trials at UF, definitely ask one of us. But in the meanwhile, you can always email Julie. Um, another question came in about someone in the family years ago had Parkinson's diagnosis and progressed really fast over weeks and passed away. Is that a variant? I would, I would guess that that probably wasn't Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a slowly changing problem. Um, anything that progressed over weeks was probably, um, there's a high chance it may have been a mistaken diagnosis, or there might've been something else going on in addition to Parkinson's. There are a lot of other conditions that overlap in the symptoms, but might have an actual different cause. And so that can be really tricky to look backwards and, and judge without knowing all the details of the case, but I can definitely say it is almost impossible that Parkinson's would um, progress that fast over weeks without something else going on. Okay. Um, there was a question about, can someone address the differences in today's view of Parkinson's as a chronic disease with many treatment options versus the previous pessimistic view of the disease? Um, and we may all have some input there, but I would say that years ago, only a few decades back, there was very little treatment for Parkinson's. Just a few decades back, there were, there were very few medicine options. And so there was little that could be done to modify the symptoms. In the past 20 or 30 years, there's been incredible progress. We have multiple classes of medicines. Even in the last five years, we've had at least five new agents come to the market. Um, and so nowadays we know that different people are at different phases of their life. Some people are young with kids and working. Some people may be in more advanced age, may be retired and may have other health conditions. And we really look at each person as an individual. We have to look at their other health conditions but we certainly have a lot more approaches. We know more about incorporating rehab and we're learning more about how the different genetic makeups might, in the future, we might check a person's genes and figure out, okay, you need this medicine and you need this medicine. And, and same thing with brain stimulation. Used to be that the device was programmed and it stimulates and we're developing devices that actually record what's happening in a unique person's brain and might be able to use their brain waves to decide what patterns they need to be stimulated. And so it's just becoming more and more personalized and more specific. Um, and I think we'll just have more and more options moving into the future. Nick, did you have anything else you wanted to add? 
Sure. I, I mean, I, I guess I'm really optimistic these days. You know, I, I started doing this over 10 years ago. Um, actually, probably even earlier than that. I'm sure Dr. Malati seen the same thing really changed. And we really are looking at sort of an, not, not just an evolution, but a revolution sort of in how we treat Parkinson's disease. You know, we used to have uh, old drugs, you know, I guess 50 years ago or more, we discovered sort of the utility of levodopa and a lot of drugs have sort of come from um, replacing dopamine or related to levodopa. We've had a lot of different drugs that come out after that. And then about, I would say now nearly 30 years ago, we had deep brain stimulator surgical options for Parkinson's disease that was another sort of evolution in the treatment of Parkinson's disease and really opened up this whole idea that we could do neuromodulation of diseases, not just Parkinson's disease, but other movement disorders and even beyond movement disorders, even Alzheimer's disease, we're using potentially um, neuromodulatory therapies. Now those aren't cures, so I would say, and I'm actually the most optimistic about this really, I feel like I am, but the last several years, we've actually seen another evolution in the treatment of these diseases. And I'm not just talking about Parkinson's disease, but reaching for what we call disease modifying therapies. So most of the therapies we have currently are symptom therapies. They treat the symptoms in a way, it's sort of a band-aid. They're highly effective in Parkinson's disease. So I'm not pooping them in any way. But the change really is that we are actively, very actively now, and the future is a bit bright, looking for what are called treatments that actually target the disease, the disease process. We'd love to say that we have the cure. That is really one of our bins, but we're actively working on this next bin, which basically is treatment that may either slow the disease progress um, and even potentially improve symptoms, but slowing the disease so that if we treat patients early on, we can maybe stop the disease and perhaps leave a person with maybe a very tiny bit of tremor, but not progress to the point where they need a wheelchair or they're no longer independent um, and need assistance. So that would be a huge advance. And I think we really are at that cusp today. Um, so I hope you, uh, there were a number of talks today, particularly Dr. Almeida's talk, um, discussed some of the new trials that are out. And you probably heard that we are, you know, increasingly starting to target the brain pathology um, and really trying to get at that. It's a really tough nut to crack. So, um, and it's gonna take a while, but the fact that many companies, um, you know, billion com companies, you know, pharmaceuticals are actually really getting into the game is a game changer. So um, I'm not pessimistic. I hope you can see that the rest of us aren't that way anymore. We're actually quite hopeful um, that we're going to see some new therapeutics. And when I say new therapeutics, something that will be a true game changer, um, just like DBS or neuromodulation was um, several years ago. Um, so, and that doesn't mean we're not continuing to work on other great treatments, um, symptomatic therapies and trying to improve them. There's been several new interesting drugs that have come out that we've discussed today as well. Um, and those are fantastic too, and gives us a lot more to use in our basically an armamentarium. We've got a lot underneath our sleeves these days to help Parkinson's patients. And that, I hope, really tells you guys that there's a lot to hope for um, in terms of treating these diseases. We've got a long way to go, but we've made a heck of a lot of progress. And the final question, because we um, made up those 10 minutes by just leaving 10 more minutes for questions. The final question is for Dr. McFarland, is there any value to having brains from individuals who lived with Parkinson's disease. Is there any value there um, for research? Sure, thanks for that question. That, that's a really great question and kind of a good segue for talking about sort of some of the research we're doing. Um, there's absolutely a lot of benefit to looking at brains for Parkinson's disease patients as well as other degenerative diseases. Um, it is true that when you look at someone's brain at the end of their life, you're looking at the end of a lifelong process. And so you are kind of looking backwards at the disease in a lot of ways, but we gain a lot of valuable insights in understanding the disease process. And we have to really, and I think one of my old mentors really said, as much as we want to work at the bench and to look at the molecular and genetics and science and all, um, and you know, do things, we really need to study patients. And the only way, one of the only ways and 
really one of the more important ways to study patients is really to look at patient tissue. And brain tissue is extremely valuable for us. Um, University of Florida has a brain bank. Um, we've had one for many years. It is a growing brain bank. Um, Parkinson's disease brains are extremely valuable to us. Um, if, if you happen to be an organ donor, um, and is this something that you would like to give as a lasting gift? Um, the program includes, we have a um, on-site sort of neuropathologist now who joined our group as part of the Fixel Institute, uh, Dr. Stefan Prokop, um, extremely well-trained. Um, we do provide a report, um, takes a lot of, a bit of time. Um, the tissue that we do collect um, is put into a bank um, if you volunteer and can be used by researchers here at the University of Florida, as well as others who have really good ideas and interesting projects. Um, that tissue is anonymized, okay? Um, so not to worry about that. Um, and there is a process that you can um, initiate. Uh, we have a coordinator here and we can get you in contact with them if that is something that you're interested in doing. It's an extremely valuable and lasting gift um, towards, you know, that eventual cure for Parkinson's disease and other degenerative diseases. So thanks for that question. Um, really great idea. And I just want to thank everyone who attended. I want to especially thank Amanda Fassenden um, and Heather Simpson, our two coordinators who really made this entire thing happen. And Charles Jacobson, who is so kind and uh, giving of his time and his talent to help run this thing and all the panelists and all the speakers. So grateful for your time, especially thank you to our audience. We hope, you'll, we hope you learned and you enjoyed it and you'll catch the sessions you didn't get to catch on the YouTube channel, share it with your friends. And please, when Amanda sends out the email later with a chance to give us feedback, let us know because we really wanna make this useful and helpful for you and let us know what you wanna hear about next year. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Saturday.